Thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we will be talking through getting started with VRPs and we will also be showing some of our testing capabilities as well. So I'm Renuka Goff. I'm a product marketing manager here at Nextmove. And our presenter today is Sebas. He's on the decision science team at Nextmove. And for today, we will be going through a quick orientation of VRPs. We will solve a VRP with the Nextmove routing app. And then Sebas is gonna walk us through creating experiments. So we'll see a batch experiment as well as an acceptance test. And of course, at the end, we will save time for Q&A. So feel free to drop those into the chat itself or use the Q&A feature and we will monitor those to make sure we answer you. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Sebas, take it away. Thanks, Rainy. So hello and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Sebastian, but people just call me Sebas. Um, I work in, in decision science, and when I'm not doing that, I am sucking at chess and also tennis. Hopefully, I don't suck as much in decision science. So let's get started. Um, so if you all are here, you probably already know what a vehicle routing problem is. Um, in case you don't, here's a quick refresher. You can see the image here on the right. Um, a vehicle routing problem is when you have a set of stops that you want to visit with a set or collection of vehicles, right? So in this map here, we have several dots um, and the colored routes represent different vehicles that are servicing those stops. So you are deciding two things in vehicle routing. One, which vehicle gets um, which stop? And two, in which order should they be serviced? Um, you can really find these sort of problems everywhere. So food delivery, right? If you've ever ordered something online or um, from your cell phone, right? You get food delivered to your door. If you've ever ordered something from Amazon, for example, you get packages delivered to your door. Also, if you're working in construction, maybe you get materials delivered to the construction site. So the learnings here are that vehicle routing problems are very complex. There's a lot of literature around them. And our learnings here is that you probably don't want to start from scratch. You want to use tooling to go fast, right? So in the same sense as in machine learning, for example, you're not multiplying matrices by hand, right? You're using libraries that do this sort of operations for you. The idea is that there are libraries for vehicle routing problems. Uh, there are products to get you started faster. With that being said, um, here's today's example. So welcome to the next move farm share. We are a fictitious logistics company, so don't Google us. Um, and we deliver fresh goods from local farms to customers' homes, right? So in the map here, you can see some arrows that are um, going to some farms, right? So in this farm, I'm picking up carrots. Here, I'm picking up, I'm picking up um, snow just because. Here, I might be picking up some bunnies, right? And then I am delivering to someone's home. So this is a delivery routing problem. And we can uh, talk about some features. So vehicles have a start and a location that can be the, um, the farm to your warehouse. You have pickups at the farms, deliveries at the customers. Uh, vehicles have a certain capacity, right? So they cannot carry everything. Uh, you have some compatibility, compatibility attributes, sorry, um, which means that a vehicle can only service some type of orders, right? So if you have premium orders, you can only be serviced by a premium vehicle, for example. You have time windows in which you wanna do your deliveries or your pickups. Uh, there's a maximum waiting time at each stop, meaning you, if you arrive before the window opens, you cannot be uh, waiting forever, right? You have stuff to do. And also something like a penalty when you're arriving late. So you have an ETA for your pickups and your deliveries. And if you arrive after that ETA, um, it's going to penalize. So more show, right? Let's tell. I don't want to bore you all here to death. So this is the uh, next move uh, console. All right, I hope the uh, size is okay. Um, and in this console, I wanna go ahead and go to the marketplace. So in the marketplace, you have apps that are ready to go, production ready. Here we can see the next move routing app. I'm gonna, I'm gonna click on it. And yeah, so the next routing app is to solve vehicle routing problems. And here are all the available features, like some of which we are using, right? Such as the precedence for pickups and deliveries. So it's basically 
out of the box, ready to go. I'm gonna go ahead and add it to my apps. Uh, let's call it uh, sample farm, save us. Cool, create app. All right, this is my app. So it's now showing up in my app section here. I'm gonna click on it. And this is the really cool part about this app. Let me go ahead and click on the API reference here. And you can see this is basically ready to go, right? Couple of clicks, you have um, an application, an endpoint. You can even see that it has my name on it. So it's personalized to you and it's production ready. So I'm gonna go ahead and start using it, right? I have this endpoint called new application run. A new application run takes my app ID, which is sample uh, farm shares, farm save us, sorry, yeah. And then I'm gonna go ahead and use the, uh, sorry, latest instance. And I'm gonna send it a JSON input. This JSON input has some stuff, uh, which are the stops, right, that I'm servicing. Uh, for, for vehicles, for example, I have a start location and an end location, what I was mentioning, a capacity. So I'm gonna go ahead and execute the run. When you execute the run, what this endpoint is gonna give you is a run ID, right? Um, this run ID is what you might use for this other endpoint to get your result. Um, so your production service hits this other endpoint, which is get, you pull for it, right? So you start uh, polling until you get a succeeded result, but you also have the run history for your app. So in this run history, you can see that it is a table that it will populate with all of your runs. I can just go ahead and click on my run ID and I can see the information. So one, this is um, the current solution. We have some unassigned stops here and there, which are the red dots. And you can debug it to your routes and you can take a look at your um, JSON output. This is what your um, service is getting in the backend. Um, cool. So back here, what did you just see? So what you just saw is that I solved a vehicle, a vehicle routing problem with the Nextmove routing app, right? It's simply low code, uh, software as a service solution. So cool characteristics of this app is that it is out of the box routing. Um, we focus a lot on flexibility and in modeling your uh, business um, requirements. So it's very flexible. You have your API endpoints fully available to manage your runs. Um, you have a suite of configurable features, right? Such as constraints, uh, you know, penalties for your value function, so on and so forth. You saw the console experience in which you can see the routes on the map. You can look at your input, you can look at your output, and you have uh, a detail of your run history. So that's really cool. And how does it fit in your architecture? It's simple. You can imagine in your infra here on the left that you have some sort of order or vehicle service, right? That is like communicating with your orders and with your vehicles. So have a little computer right there. And you're probably pulling in info from databases, right? So little disk because it's a uh, storage. So that service is gonna hit the post endpoint for the runs. That's gonna start a new run, right? And then you might have a different service. It might be part of the same service. We don't know, right? Well, you submit a payload. Um, the assignment service is gonna go ahead and hit the get endpoint to get the, the run results, right? So this is a little check because you assigned the stuff, right? And then your assignment service is gonna do something useful such as send push notifications to a cell phone or send some emails or store in a database, right? So it's uh, quite fast to get started. Um, but what if things change, right? So it's time to test. Let's see here, we have a Slack conversation, right? Or a <laughs> chat conversation with Rainu, who is a product manager and me, who I am a decision scientist. So Rainu is telling me, hey, operations um, is telling me, sorry, that some orders are not going out. And a lot of our vans are half empty, please help. Uh, this is actually something that used to happen to me a lot back in the day. So I used to work for this company called Rappi and uh, it's a super app of food delivery, groceries delivery, um, deliveries. And my Slack was basically like at, at, um, at a limit of notifications all the time, right? So I was getting ping from every city saying like, hey, this might be not working or hey, can we change this? Hey, because I was managing the assignment algorithm. So this is like literally not far from the truth. 
So I'll say something like, happy to check this. Let me pull up a recent run. I will go to console, as you just saw. And I can say, uh, for example, in this case, in which we saw the actual orders not being assigned, right? We, we saw the red dots. So it might be the vehicle order matching thing. And here's what I'm looking at. The context here is that in the farm share, actually, we have compatibility attributes for um, restricting which vehicles um, get assigned which orders, but that's actually not being used in this fictitious world. So um, my hunch to say decision scientist is, what if I wanna turn off those attributes, right? So I'm gonna tell Renew, hey, we can remove that constraint and time windows too. You know, time windows tend to be very restrictive. So because we have the late arrival penalty that is already trying to keep, to keep every stop on time, I'm gonna go ahead and remove it as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and test this actually live. So more talk, yes, we don't want more talk. We want more do. I know that's not an expression, sorry. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go to a different app, which is this routing app, it's a custom app. And in this routing app, I will run an experiment. So for experiments, you have input sets. An input set is a collection of inputs, a collection of files. Here, I have this input set with 14 files and it is a control for testing new features. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch a batch experiment. Um, a batch experiment is gonna tell me, well, this is the test farm assignment, for example. It's gonna ask me for the input set and this is the, the, um, like the, the true important part of this is that you are comparing two instances, right? What are instances? I can click on it right here, open it in a, in a separate window actually. So instances are um, what your endpoints used to run. So in this case, I have a production instance and a develop instance. So if you see closely here, those instances have uh, different versions, right? So uh, develop has, 0.2, production has 0.1. And why is that? Because I wanna test a new version in develop. What is this version? Well, I can go to versions here and version 0.2 says disable time windows, compatibility attributes, right? So I push new code or configure different parameters which disable the time windows and the compatibility attributes. That's V0.2. I have my two instances. So I wanna compare develop against production. So here in my experiment, Coming back to it, I wanna compare develop against production. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch that experiment, which is right here. But because I already um, made one and in the interest of time, we're gonna go ahead and look at the experiment. So in the experiment, you're comparing develop against production. And because you have 14 files in your input, you are doing a total of 28 runs. You can compare the value function of your two instances, but that's not actually very interesting, right? We care about the business. We care about the carrots and the bunnies. So we actually wanna take a look at some custom metrics here. So if we're getting trouble with assignment, right? We want those um, unassigned orders to go down. So I have custom unplanned stops here. Cool. So. In production, currently, we have uh, some unplanned stops, right? But in develop, I was actually able to push those to zero. This is ideal, of course, not every time everything is as ideal. So Rainu was saying something about, hey, how can we use our fleet more efficiently and vans are half empty? So this gives me the clue of there might be something wrong with vehicle utilization. So there's actually a metric that's here, custom vehicle utilization. And this is literally the vehicles being used over the total number of vehicles. Um, we can see that the box plot on develop is shifting up versus the one in production, meaning that um, at the 99th percentile, you're actually almost getting a 100% utilization, right? So although in some instances it, not, it might not improve, in general, you have a better behavior, which is what you want. Um, and this is really cool because if you want to keep close control of your metrics, you can go ahead and launch an acceptance test, right? So an experiment is letting you sort of like feel your product 
to understand what happens if I do this, if I do that. But an acceptance test is going to tell you, hey, I am going to accept your test. So I can say sample test for farm, right? Um, it's going to ask you for a baseline instance. So our baseline is production, right? That's what we care about. And I'm testing against my changes on develop. So my input, I'm going to use the same one. And this is going to ask you for some metrics. So our metrics actually live in result custom dot on plan stops. And I want my on plan stops to decrease. I also care about, in this case, let's go wild. Let's do another metric, right? <laughs> Vehicle utilization. And that one should increase. So this is actually accurate. I can run the test and you, in the interest of time, I already have <laughs> a test ready for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on it, which is the same one. And what you're gonna see is that for each metric, it's gonna give you a go, no go um, signal. So unplanned stops should decrease. You're good to go because we already saw that it's pushing to zero. Um, and then for vehicle utilization, as I was saying, not in every case you're increasing utilization. So you actually have some instances here in which you're not um, improving utilization, but in general you are. So that's the behavior that you're after. Um, cool. So this means that I can hook up some acceptance tests to my production flow so that before I launch a new algorithm to production, I can make sure that my metrics are not altered. Cool. So why does decision model testing matter? Well, I have like four big gotchas here. So first, mistakes are expensive and the tolerance for error is low. You want to go ahead and reduce those mistakes as much as you can. So if I were to have done this before I launched the current algorithm to production, I would have noticed that the implant stops um, were up. Troubleshooting should be straightforward. So the fact that you can have a console, you can run tests, you can share your results with uh, product managers, product owners, um, makes it more collaborative, right? And the fact that you can, with a configurable set of inputs, get the same results, it gets you a uh, clear, repeatable path uh, to go to production with your algorithms. And ultimately what this means is that stakeholders trust your outcomes. And who are the stakeholders? Well, there are different types of stakeholders, right, in these uh, decision models. So you have Rainu, which is the product manager, right? She's looking at metrics and she's telling me, hey, 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 production is telling me, or not production, but operations is telling me that something's wrong. And you have those operators, right? Those logistics people that are caring about the actual operation, uh, reducing worker burnout, so on and so forth. And from the technology perspective, you have your DevOps here, right? Or your site reliability engineers. Um, and they care about like which version is live in prod? What's the SLA of the endpoint? Um, should we push a new change? So um, aside from that, you have the um, algorithm or algorithms engineer, such as myself, right? The decision scientist. Um, and we care about like, hey, would I change the solver config? If I change the solver config, does this yield better results? I want to go ahead and know for sure if that's true or not. And ultimately, what that does is impact the business, right? So ultimately, business leaders care about like, is this algorithm providing value to my business? Um, so yeah, this was um, really fast but an overview of what is possible with vehicle routing to get started super fast. So I want to give some takeaways from this talk. The first one is that you probably don't want to solve your piece from scratch. Um, you can try the next move low code solution, which is the next move routing app that has a lot of out of the box features just to get you started fast and get you testing hypotheses fast. Um, two, performing experiments. It's not like an, should I experiment? No, it, it's not a question. Like you have to experiment to know for sure that your model is doing what you expect it to do. And how do you measure that? With metrics. Um, and ultimately those metrics, you control them through acceptance tests, right? So you can make the decision of go, no go with this new version of the algorithm. Um, and what this all entails is that you have that clear, repeatable path to production, right? So algorithms should be repeatable, they should be testable, they should be explainable. I, I, the, if I have a way in which I can repeat a result, 
then I can also explain that result. So with that, I thank you everyone for this, um, uh, for the time here, and we have a bit of time for Q and A. Perfect. Thanks so much, Sebas. That was a wonderful demonstration of the new testing capabilities. I'm sure folks are excited to go and get their hands on it. So I think we have a few questions here, some really great questions, actually. So yep. I will start off with, um, it's a two-part question. So what okay. are the features that are offered out of the box? And then following up to that, can I add time-related constraints? Yeah. So great question. Uh, let me come back here to console, uh, to my app that is out of the box. Uh, oh, sorry, marketplace here. Yep. So here are the features that are out of the box. So as I was mentioning, you have some constraints such as compatibility attributes, capacity quantity, um, penalties for arriving early or late. Of course, I'm not going to read all of them, but it mainly boils down to you have constraints to make sure that the right orders get assigned to the right vehicles, and you have objectives so that um, you can control what your solver is optimizing for. Um, in this case, you know, uh, uh, applying a penalty for arriving early or late is going to tell the solver, hey, I want to visit this stop first, because if I visit it after, then I'm going to be late, right? So uh, the full list of constraints or features is um, available in our docs. You can go to our docs and you can go to features here and you can see all the features. Um, and then the second part of the question was time-related features, right? So for time-related features, you have not only those penalties that I was mentioning, right? Early arrival, late arrival. You also have um, the time window for stops. You can also handle um, how your durations want to be parsed. So how long does it take to go from A to B? That, that is also possible. Great, thank you. And this one is somewhat similar. So I'm going to jump around in the questions here. Um, how can we add customized constraints to the problem? So say I want to make sure a truck stops at a location for at least 48 hours. Is it possible yep. to incorporate that? Yeah, totally. So that's actually a great question. Uh, the first uh, product that I showed was like sort of the out-of-box solution. But if you want to get more customized, it's actually funny. It's showing up on screen. You have the uh, custom constraints option. So with custom constraints, you literally add um, code, right? That ultimately depends on a function that returns a Boolean. So true or false, right? So for this sort of like problem set, if I do this assignment, does it pass that constraint, yes or no? So with custom constraints that behave just as any other code, you can code like that constraint that you're saying for like 48 hours or, or any other um, constraint as well. Perfect. Okay, a couple more and we have some time. So are there any publicly available details about the algorithm used behind the scenes for a curious optimization enthusiast that we have in the crowd today. Um, yeah, so so that's actually a great question. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and stay in the docs land for now. Uh, get started with vehicle routing. So you have two options, right? The uh, next routing app is the first thing that I showed you. Uh, platform with a custom app is the second thing that I showed you. Um, both, if you see here, both options use the next route template. So um, next route is part of our SDK, which is publicly available uh, uh, with all the API definitions. So if I go to reference here and I go to the Go SDK, bloop, I'm going to jump into next route. So this is really for the people who are very curious about how stuff works. Like it has the definitions of the constraints, the interfaces, the objectives, and how they interact with each other. Ultimately, there is a little bit of detail in the um, custom constraints and custom objectives pages as well. So I can go to custom objectives and it's gonna tell you briefly about um, what is a move, what is a solution, what is uh, this method doing, what is this other method doing? So that gives like an orientation of how the algorithm works. 
Um, ultimately, what we have is an ALNS solver that um, performs different um, moves on on the um, like engine, if you will, right? So the ALNS solver is like trying out different moves, and then the the engine is telling like, hey, this is a good move, this is a bad move. So that's um, generally how how it works. But I would just tell um, tell you to to read the uh, a little bit on the docs for this one. Perfect. Okay, we're getting through them. A few more. Um, this is tied to that question as well. Is it possible to modify the existing algorithm to bring some more custom logic and parameters in? Yeah, totally. So um, if you really want to start customizing, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, go to get started here. Platform. So platform is when you use our developer tools to create a template for you and you start customizing that. So out of the box, we, sorry, right here. Yeah. Like this is the, the main code that runs. In, in that main code, you can see that we get a new model from a new model um, function, which is basically um, the out of the box solution that handles everything depending on what you pass it via JSON. Once you have that model, like you can literally do whatever you want to it, right? So the model is a uh, model. Yep. The model is an interface that has like different um, ways in which you can interact with it. And you also, aside from the model, you have the solver. So if you really want to start customizing, you can tell the model, like, I don't want to use the, the, the default start solution. I want to give it my own start solution. I want to give it my own options. I want to give it my own strategy for making the moves on which order is sent to which vehicle. So yes, it's fully customizable. Um, we just give you a really good starting point to start customizing from. Wonderful. Okay, the next one here is how should I think about instances? So I think you showed um, when you were doing some experiments there, how you would set up instances. Um, are there yeah. other ways to think about how to set those up? Yeah, so I actually want to answer that question by first talking about versions. So version equals code, right? So if I push new code to the app, you have a new version, uh, or that's how you should um, think about it at least, right? So that you can uh, move between versions easily. So a version is associated with code, and then on that version, you can have different instances. What's the difference if all the instances use the same code? It's just parameter configuration. So you might have different regions on your on your like operation, right? Like different cities, different neighborhoods. And then, for example, if you have a super busy city, then you want to pack many orders. So you want to go ahead and say max orders equals 10. But if you have a very slow moving city, maybe you don't care about packing that many orders. So you want to go ahead and say max orders is four. Um, so basically versions are code. And then for that code, for that version, you have different instances, which are um, configuration of options or parameters. Wonderful. All right, I think we are at time. Thank you for all the wonderful questions and thank you, Sebas, for all the thoughtful answers. If you asked a question and we didn't have time to answer it live, don't worry, we will make sure to reach out to you and answer those directly with you. So keep an eye out for that. We will make sure we keep that conversation going. Um, and in that spirit of, please feel free, dive right in, uh, create a Next Move account for free and start playing with our sample app. There are experiments directly there um, that you'll be able to play with. And then talk with our team, contact us. We love talking about optimization, as you can tell uh, from Sebas' presentation here, uh, we get pretty excited about it. So reach out to us. And then of course, uh, we have plenty of other resources, including our docs, blogs, videos like this one. Uh, we have uh, plenty of those on demand. So please go ahead and check those out and we will see you on the next Tech Talk. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.